Friends, so this uh, chapter is on the brain and the cranial nerves. The prime learning objectives in this chapter is to study the anatomy and physiology of the brain. You know, we'll study the different brain locations, the different regions of the brain, the hollow cavity that's inside the brain, it's called the ventricle of the brain. We'll study the six main um, divisions of the brain. It's called uh, the cerebrum, cerebellum, or the little brain, diencephalon, mesencephalon, or midbrain. We'll uh, talk about the structures uh, that uh, control our emotions and our memory. It's called the limbic system. And we'll talk about pons and medulla oblongata. So by the end of the chapter, by studying the chapter, you should have mastered the different locations of the brain, the structures of the brain, and the function of each part of your brain. And uh, you already know that the brain is made with this very delicate mass of tissue. It's very, very soft uh, neural tissue. So it is uh, protected and it has to be nourished and supported. We'll study how that is accomplished. A whole brain is actually floating in cerebrospinal fluid. It's for protection uh, and nourishment. So we'll see how the CSF is formed in the brain and uh, how it uh, circulates in the brain. The last slide uh, in this chapter would be the different cranial nerves that uh, leave the brain. And we'll study the function of each of the cranial nerves. So this slide is showing the embryonic development. So this is in a, in a baby, the first few weeks of pregnancy. So here's the blastocyte and then it has, it uh, slowly develops into uh, the, you know, ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. So the ectoderm folds inward it was a, a bunch of cells, it's called as a neural plate. They will invaginate, they will fold in to form something called as a neural fold. And then the neural fold actually will completely cut off from the outside and become a neural tube. So it's the neural tube that is going to further develop into the brain. So if you see the picture in the bottom, you can see uh, the neural tube uh, so this is before around like two to three work, two to three weeks of pregnancy. It, you can see all these uh, vesicles that are developing. So three to four week embryo, the 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 anterior part of the brain swells up to form a vesicle. You can call that a differentiation. It's called prosencephalon that will further develop into the telencephalon, diencephalon, and then that's going to end up as the cerebrum of your brain. The diencephalon relates and it becomes the thalamus, hypothalamus and epithalamus of your brain. And mesencephalon becomes the midbrain, MM. The rhombencephalon is the hindbrain. So that uh, vesicle is going to differentiate into two more vesicles called metencephalon and myelencephalon. That is going to become the pons, uh, the cerebellum, and, uh, and the medulla oblongata of the brain. So that is why nourishment of a growing embryo or like nourishment during pregnancy is very, very important because you can see that the neural development happens like from the third week onward. So this, is, uh, this picture is explaining neural development in a human. Uh, embryo. So we already know your brain is controlling your entire body. We are alive. Your personality, your mood, your emotions, homeostasis, everything is in the brain. So it is the control center of your body. And uh, you can see See here, it's a comparison of uh, the primate's brain to a human brain. 
So higher up the spinal cord you go, it's getting the function is becoming more and more complex. So what makes a human being a human is the highly developed frontal cortex. See, you can see, we know chimpanzees are very uh, brilliant, but you can see compared to the human brain, our brain is much larger and with a, the frontal cortex, this part of the brain is called as the frontal cortex, is highly developed. It's very unique to human beings. So the neural tissue that we studied last class, you know, 97% of the neural tissue is found in your brain. And it's about three pounds, uh, adult brain is three pounds and it's about 1500 cc. So it is not solid, the brain is not solid. It has internal cavities and chambers through which the cerebrospinal fluid will flow. It is very, very delicate. So it is protected by your skull and by uh, other things also, you know, like the dura matter and all that. The six main parts of the brain is the cerebrum, which is the largest part of your brain, cerebellum, which is the little brain, diencephalon, which is like right behind your eyes, actually, um, mesencephalon or the midbrain, and then pons and medulla oblongata. These three structures are also called as the brain stem. It is uh, continuous with the spinal cord. So as you come up the spinal cord and medulla oblongata, so here are the basic functions of survival, you know, your breathing, your blood pressure and all that. But higher up you go in the brain, it becomes more and more complicated higher order of thinking and planning and executive decision-making, everything is in the higher cere cerebral parts of the brain. So the brain controls your body physiology. So it is the seat of homeostasis, your consciousness, you know, what makes us human, our consciousness, our thought, our intelligence, all of them are, um, the physiology is hidden here in the cerebrum. And there's like discoveries about the brain every day. Our understanding of the brain is growing and growing. It's super complicated. And also very, very interesting. Brain is like one of the most interesting things you can study. So we'll go over the six main divisions of the brain that I told you. Cerebrum is the largest part of your brain. So all this that you're seeing in pink here is the cerebrum. It is the seat of conscious thought process and your intelligence. This is where you're going to store your memory and processing of your motor, uh, your sensory information, your conscious and subconscious regulation of your skeletal muscle contractions are in your cerebrum. And here in the cross section of the human brain, you can see the periphery of the brain has, uh, is dark colored, right? It's, it's called gray matter. You probably heard that before. There is a bookstore in Amherst called gray matter. And then the white parts are your axon tracts, which is the white matter. So you already know bundles of the cell body is called as the base a nuclei, right? So you can see gray matter on the outside and there's some right in the center of the brain also. That is called basal nuclei. And you can see, see the brain is thrown into folds. See all these ridges that you see, the ridges and the furrows and the fissures. So the raised parts of the brain are called gyrus. So here gyrus is singular, gyri is plural, the word here, gyrus. The dips in the brain are called sulcus or sulci for plural. And if, the, if it's very, very deep, they'll call it as a fissure. So that's why you're able to see all these different lobes. So any time in biology, when we see a lot of ridges and furrows, it's actually to increase the surface area so that we can hold more neurons in a small space. So the next uh, objective for us would be to study, uh, see here, there is 
a deep fissure called longitudinal fissure that divides the left hemisphere from the right hemisphere. And uh, see the different lobes of the cerebrum are named after the bone that they are found under, right? So the frontal lobe is right under the frontal uh, bone. And we have occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and the parietal lobe. So this is a lateral view, and this is a cross-section of the lateral view of the cerebrum. There is a central sulcus that divides the frontal lobe and the par uh, parietal lobe. The lateral sulcus is going to divide the frontal and the temporal lobe. The parieto occipital lobe is going to divide the parietal from the occipital lobe. And here you can see the different two hemispheres. I also want you all to look up uh, something called neural plasticity, neuroplasticity. It's a very important phenomena. Even though different uh, structures of the brain have specific function, they have discovered that it's very interesting that like, let's say you lose a part of your brain because of a fatal accident. They have found other parts of the brain are able to jump in and uh, meet that function of the brain. So this picture is showing the gray matter that is found in the center of your brain. It is called as the basal nuclei. So you can see the nuclei in the periphery of the brain that is called as the neural cortex. And then we have some gray matter right in the center of the brain. It's continuous with the gray matter of the spinal cord. So here you can see there are two main nuclei. When you say, see there's something called lentiform nucleus. It is made up of putamen and globus pallidus. And then we have the caudate nucleus, which is the, uh, the slender head of the caudate nucleus. It will also have a tail. So that is the caudate nucleus. This picture, you know, it's a, it's a very weird picture, but it's showing the sensory and motor areas of the cerebral cortex. The sensory areas will receive information that is related to sensation. And the motor cortex is involved in uh, planning, control, and execution of voluntary movements. So if you see this picture, you can see the primary motor area is shown in red and the sensory area is shown in blue. For example, say this gyri is going to respond to your hip and trunks, the, the motor function of your hip and trunks. And this gyri would be for shoulder. And this would be for wrist and hand fingers. And here in the sensory area, you can see, you can see a huge area of the gyri is for your hands. That's why we have a lot of sense receptors in your fingers. You know, like if you've ever seen a blind person reading Braille, you know, it's all by touch, right? So we have a lot of receptors, sensory receptors and processing happening in this gyri of the brain. Similarly, you can also see a large part is uh, going for your lips. It's very, very sensitive. So this weird picture is showing the, the regions of the brain that is responsible for the motor and the sensory, uh, sensory and the motor functions of the brain. So now like it's time to put some function to the different parts of the brain. So here, this Broca's area is for speech. So it's link, linked to like speech production for language comprehension, and some of the pathologies would be aphasia or uh, uh, shuttering. So anytime uh, they want to study the function of the brain, you know, like if this area has a lesion or a disease, and then what will happen was the patient will have trouble speaking. Another area is the Wernicke's uh, comprehension of speech area. It's adjacent to here, it's here, Wernicke's area. 
So coming to function, your visual cortex would be here. So this is for processing your sight. Auditory cort cortex is for information from sound receptors. Olfactory cortex is here. Gustatory cortex will be here. So that is for information from your taste receptors. So this is, it's called brain mapping. So different parts of your brain is connected to different function. And how did they find it? It's by pathologies. You know, if your frontal lobe is uh, damaged, then all the functions of the frontal lobe will be lost and so forth. So the different regions of the cerebrum are thoroughly connected. They are called fibers. So the so each cerebral, a very interesting phenomena is the each cerebral hemisphere will receive sensory, sensory information from the opposite side of the body. For example, the signals from the left of your body is processed on the right brain. And the signals from the left part of your body will be processed in the right brain. I'm repeating myself. So it kind of crosses over. So here you can see all these tracks that are found in the brain. So here, corpus callosum is the structure that is keeping the right and the left hemisphere together. And you can see uh, projection fibers, see projection fiber, that is going to connect the cerebrum with the lower areas of the brain. So it's going to connect the cortex to the lower areas of the brain. So they are called projection fibers. There's also commissural fibers. So we have anterior and posterior commissural fibers. So these fibers are connecting the left and the right brain. This is the corpus callosum that I told you about. And there's also association fibers. So the fibers that are within the hemisphere, they're called association fibers. So these are the bridges within the brain. So the take-home messages every lobe is connected and it's communicating with the other parts of the brain. Brain hemispheres. So again, this picture is talking about how the, uh, see when, when you say you are left brain dominant, that means you're going to be very good in reading and writing math, decision-making, speech, language, uh, and comprehension. So the main functions of the left hemisphere are these functions. The right hemisphere controls your creativity, your artistic nature, your musical abilities, your, your very abstract, your uh, senses of touch and smell and taste, they are all highly developed. And uh, this is also a very interesting picture. So here you can see a right hand holding the pencil and all the information of that right hand is actually processed in the left brain. And here this left hand is maybe touching something and that information is processed in the right brain. This is a very interesting story about uh, a person called uh, Philinus Gage. So this is in, uh, in the 18th century and this man is working on the railway track and then there was an accident. And then this rod actually pierces through his front, frontal cortex. And people think that he won't make it, but he actually lives. Uh, the surprising thing is uh, he was a very uh, nice person before the injury. And then his personality changed uh, to anger and meanness after the accident. So. This is a clue that your personality resides in your frontal cortex. Moving on to the next uh, part of your brain is the diencephalon. Here's the diencephalon. So it is made up of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The thalamus is also called as the switchboard of your brain. So all the sensory information that shoots up, your, up the brain will pass in the thalamus. And this is the relay and processing center of uh, sensory information. So if you think about a switchboard person, when they get a call, 
No, so this is in the 1950s and 60s when we used to have switchboards. They will say, you know, uh, which department, please? And then you say uh, pathology, and then they will transfer the message to the pathology department or neurology department. So very similarly, the thalamus is the switchboard of your brain. It will direct the sensory signals to different parts of the brain for processing. Your hypothalamus, on the other hand, is the seat of homeostasis. It controls your emotions, all your autonomic functions and hormone production. Because you can see from the hypothalamus, you can see the pituitary gland here, which is the master gland of your body. So the thalamus is processing your sensory information. Hypothalamus plays a huge role in your hormone production, your emotions, your homeostasis of temperature, your hunger drive, your thirst drive, uh, and your pituitary gland that makes like several hormones are housed here. You can see all the pineal gland that is responsible for melatonin. It is found right across uh, the hypothalamus. So these two structures together are called as the diencephalon of the brain. So what are some of the hormones that are made in the hypothalamus and what structures are found in the hypothalamus? There is a structure called mam mammillary body, mammillary body that process olfactory information and also some other sensory information. It controls reflexes, uh, eating moments, and uh, also recollective memory when you recall something. It's all housed in the mammillary body. In fundibulum, Russ is talking about the stock of the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is a right behind your eyes. So you can see how the pituitary gland is hanging here. The stalk is called as the infundibulum. It is connecting the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. It will have an area called tuberal area that is located between the infundibulum and the mammillary body. And it helps to control the function of the pituitary gland. You're going to restudy all of this when you're studying the endocrine system in AP2. So let's look at some of the main functions of the hypothalamus. It's a master gland, very, very important. It is important for subconscious control of the skeletal muscles, all the autonomic function in your body. It can control activities of the nervous system and endocrine system. It will secrete some very important hormones like antidiuretic hormone, uh, antidiuretic hormone. So the hormone uh, that's responsible for holding on to water in your body. It produces uh, emotional drives, behavioral drives, you know, like your hunger and your thirst. It will uh, coordinate your, some of your autonomic functions. Hypothalamus is responsible for your homeostasis, right? So your body temperature. Uh, it also has the pineal gland, which is responsible for your circadian rhythms of your body, you know, like the day and night cycles. You know, when night comes, you naturally feel sleepy. So it's all a function of the hypothalamus. Very important. Limbic system. So this is, you know, like we've heard people say, oh, she has a very highly developed limbic system. You know, she can cry for simple things. So limbic system is all about emotions and your mood. So these are brain structures that are found on either side of the thalamus. It's uh, responsible for your emotions, your behavior, and also long-term memory and uh, olfaction. Some of the important structures you can see here are called amygdala. See, this is amygdala, hypothalamic nuclei, hippocampus. So they are found on either side of the thalamus. Amygdala is very important because this is the seat for your fight or flight response. So, so when you're feeling uh, emotions like fear, it's your amygdala, your anger, your aggression is all amygdala. 
um, it also plays a response role for decision making. Your hippocampus is your long term memory. When your short term memory becomes a long term memory, you know, that's why you're able to recall something that happened in kindergarten when you were five years old, you know, something happened and you still remember it. So it's all the hippocampus. It also plays a role in uh, spatial navigation. Some of the pathologies is when uh, in Alzheimer's, when there's memory loss and de, um, uh, you know, disorientation, it is because of uh, lesions in the hippocampus. So that is the limbic system. So moving on to the uh, brain stem. So the brain stem has three main parts. The midbrain or the mesencephalon here, right under the thalamus and the hypothalamus. There is a bulge called pons. And then it's medulla oblongata that's going to run into the spinal cord. The middle brain or mesencephalon will process visual and auditory data. It is also responsible for generation of reflective somatic molecular responses, and it is the seat of consciousness. The pons is the bridge. It is like a connection. Your cerebellum or the little brain is right here. So it is the connecting the cerebellum to the brain stem. And it's going to be involved in somatic and visceral, visceral motor control. Pons. Medulla oblongata, very, very important. It connects the brain to the spinal cord. It's going to, it's like a bridge. It's going to relay information and it is going to regulate autonomic functions like your heart rate, your blood pressure and digestion, very important. So these are the three regions of the brainstem. A little bit more about medulla oblongata. So here's the medulla oblongata. So it's the connection between the brain and the spinal cord, and it's going to co uh, coordinate complex autonomic functions and visceral functions. So it's going to control your heart rate. So there's a lot of nuclei that can be found in this region. Uh, that is both sensory and motor nuclei of the cranial nerves are found here. So this is the relay station for sensory and motor pathways. There's other structures that you can see here in this picture. It, these are midbrain structures called colliculus, superior and inferior colliculus. And you can see uh, other structures that are also labeled here. Moving on to the little brain or the hind brain here is shown in blue. You can see the gyri and sulci are a little different. And you can see that it has two hemispheres. The central part is called as the vermis. It has an anterior lobe, a primary fissure. And then in the cross section, you can see a very interesting tree-like pattern. It's called arbor vitae. So this is the second largest part of your brain. This part of your brain, the cerebellum, is responsible for your uh, balance. It coordinates any repetitive movements. It also has two hemispheres, the left and the right hemispheres. It is made up of a, a very unique neuron called Purkinje cells, named after the scientist. You can see the highly branched dendritic branches of the Purkinje cell. So the, these cells are found in the cerebellar cortex. In the cross section, you can see the tree-like structure. It's called arbor vitae. It is highly branched white matter. And in this, you can see the cerebellar nuclei that is embedded here. And they are full of Purkinje cells. The, the peduncles will refer to the tracks within the brain stem connecting to the cerebrum and the spinal cord. So the main function of the cerebellum is to coordinate complex somatic motor patterns. And it'll, it is responsible for your balance in your body. It is going to coordinate repetitive motion in your body. When you get drunk, it's your cerebellum that is affected. That's why like an alcoholic drunk person, 
they lose their balance and they stagger when they walk out of the bar. We have to talk about um, cerebrospinal fluid. So, and the ventricles of the brain. So ventricles are the hollow cavities in your brain. So right under the cerebellum, cerebrum, you can see the lateral ventricle. So we have the left and the right lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, and then there is a aqueduct or like a, a hollow, uh, like a pipe, and then the fourth ventricle. So we have four ventricles, two lateral ventricles, third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle, which is all connected by aqueducts. So here we have another anterior view. You can see the lateral ventricle. So we, we see the right and the left. We see the third ventricle, the aqueduct, and the fourth ventricle. So this is the hollow cavity that is found inside the brain. These ventricles will be lined with ependymal cells. And you know ependymal cells are responsible for making uh, the cerebrospinal fluid. The two ventricles are divided by uh, a tissue called septum pellucidum. The third ventricle uh, is communicating. You can see the third ventricle is communicating with the other ventricles with the interventricular foramen here. The fourth ventricle is extending into the medulla oblongata and it is continuous with the spinal cord, the central canal of the spinal cord. You can see how. So if CSF is made here, it has a conduit. That's why when they do us, if you want to see what's happening in the brain, they will do a spinal tap because it's the same fluid that's going to flow over your brain and into to the uh, base of your spinal cord. So it also, there is a narrow canal here, which is called cerebral aqueduct. See cerebral aqueduct, and it's going to the fourth ventricle. So the specialized cells that line the ventricles are called chloride plexus, chloride plexus. So here they will, uh, they, they are richly nourished with uh, arteries, and then they are able to uh, convert the blood plasma into cerebrospinal fluid. Our body is making about 500, half a liter of cerebrospinal fluid every day. And this picture here is actually showing how the CSF is flowing in your brain. So here, the CSF is secreted by the, it's shown in red here, chloride plexus of the lateral ventricles. Then it flows through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. This chloride plexus here also, and it's going to add more CSF. Then it's going to flow down the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. The fo here also, there is some um, uh, CSF made. You know, chloride plexus in the fourth ventricle also is going to add on to the CSF. Then it is, it is also able to take the uh, lateral apertures and the medial apertures, and it can flow around the brain. See, it's going to flow around the brain, and it can bathe the external surface of the brain. And then here, there's something called arachnoid villus. I'm going to show you in the next few slides, where it can filter out and clean the CSF as it's flowing. So this is the pathway of CSF in the brain. So it, it, it squishes like inside the brain, it goes out, it flows around the brain, and then it goes down the spinal cord, up the spinal cord. So it is constantly bathing uh, the brain with nourishment. It is the source of nutrients for the brain. And here, this picture again is showing the arachnoid villi that I just told you about. So um, I haven't talked about the three um, layers of the brain. So this, is, uh, this projection is called as a arachnoid villi, which is an extension into the arachnoid space of the dura matter. These granulations are able to absorb the CSF and clean the CSF. 
So the cerebrospinal fluid is going to surround the brain, nourish the brain, protect the brain, transport nutrients, and remove the waste. Here's a pathology where there is a accumulation of CSF in the brain. Uh, they will actually drain it. Uh, it's called hydrocephalus. So the brain is protected by the spinal, uh, not, sorry, the brain is protected by the skull. It is protected by the three layers of the meninges that you studied in the spinal cord. It's the same three layers, cranial meninges and the cerebrospinal fluid. And the most important one here is or the neural tissue has the blood brain barrier that you studied. So only the nourishment that the brain is able to diffuse into the brain. All the toxins that can be found in the blood will never enter the brain because the brain is super uh, important for life and it is protected by these three structures of the brain. So here's the three meninges of the brain. We already studied this uh, in the spinal cord. So we have the scalp, and then we have the periosteum, which is the bone. Uh, periosteum, which is connective tissue of the bone. Then we have the bone, the diploe of the bone, compact, spongy, compact bone. And the, the dura matter has two layers, the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. Then comes the arachnoid matter, the spider mom. Pia matter is the gentle mother or the connective tissue that will dip into the gyri and sulci and sticking to the brain. And you can see right here are the arteries that are going to nourish the brain. So just like the spinal cord, we have the dura matter, arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. The subarachnoid space is the space between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. So this dura matter will dip into the brain, dividing the brain into the different hemispheres. So false cerebri will... Um, divide the two hemispheres of the brain. This will have the superior sagittal sinus and the, uh, so these dural folds will have these sinuses. So the sinuses are, uh, are channels that are found in between the endosteal and the meningeal layers of the dura matter. So these sinuses will form uh, uh, like, it will give the space for blood uh, and arteries to travel, arteries and veins to travel. So these sinuses, you can see how the arteries and veins can be found here. So false cerebri is dividing the uh, right and the left hemisphere. False cerebelli is dividing the cerebellum and the other parts of the brain. Tentorium cerebelli will divide the, see, tentorium cerebelli is going to cere uh, divide the cerebellum and the cerebrum. So these are the dipping of the dura matter into the brain, making the different uh, uh, sections of the brain. Again, see, it's protecting the brain. If you heard of uh, shaken baby syndrome, right? The, the false cerebri is not developed. So it's like still developing in a baby. All these cerebr cerebris are not developed in a young baby. So when you shake the baby, so this is like a knife inside the brain and then our brain tissue is so soft. So that's why it leads to brain damage. That's why you should never shake a baby. This picture is showing the blood brain barrier that we already studied. So here you can see the blood brain barrier is formed by tight, uh, junctions between the um, uh, arteries. So here are the endothelial cells of the capillaries and only oxygen and carbon dioxide and nutrients will uh, uh, diffuse inside the cell. And the astrocytes, astrocytes and other cells uh, are going to form the blood-brain barrier, thereby the neurons are protected. The astrocytes can also release chemicals and they will uh, decide the permeability of the, the simple squamous epithelial cells here. So the blood-brain barrier is formed by special ependymal cells also that surround the uh, capillaries. So thereby, only nutrients will enter the neurons and toxins are kept away from the neurons. 
our blood, our brain is a very needy organ. It needs a lot of oxygen, like 20% of your glucose and oxygen is needed by the brain. It needs oxygen constantly. So of course it has a rich supply of oxygen coming in through the carotid artery. So we have a carotid artery that will divide into internal and external carotid arteries and we'll have vertebral arteries. You're gonna study this in AP2. All these arteries will come up and in the base of the brain, it'll form like a rotary. It is called a circle of villus. And then it will divide and divide and divide, making sure every cell in your brain is nourished with arteries. And then it leaves the brain as the jugular vein. So anytime there is a blockage, you know, and the, there is a loss of uh, blood supply and nutrient supply, it is called as a um, cerebrovascular accident or a stroke. You know, and then that is that can be very very serious. Here's the last slide, and there's a mnemonic here that you can use to remember these uh, different nerves of the cranium. So there are 12 nerves and they are denoted by uh, numerical alphabets. So the first nerve is called as the olfactory nerve because that nerve is going to, is found right above your nostrils and it'll dip into the nasal cavity and is responsible for olfaction. So you, it helps you to smell things, olfaction. Nerve number two is for your eyes, optic nerve. Nerve number three is your oculomotor nerve. So this is going to control your eye muscles. Four is your trochlear nerve. This is going to control the superior oblique muscle of your eyes. Your trigeminal nerve that goes to your face, your teeth and your sinuses. So it is both sensory and the motor function of that nerve would be uh, muscles of mastication. I can't hear you, Professor. Can you hear me now? Yes. So here's eight. So that's the vestibular cochlear nerve. You're going to study this when you study uh, equilibrium and hearing. So it's all about hearing. And here's uh, nine. Glossopharyngeal nerve. Glosso means tongue. Pharyngeal nerve. So it's going to the musculature of your tongues and your uh, Sensory part would be the part of your tongue, tonsils, pharynx. We have a very important nerve called vagus nerve that is going, it's like a very large nerve. It's going to dip into your thoracic region and the abdominal region and your heart and all that. It's called as a wandering nerve. So it's going to control your heart, your lungs, your bronchi and your GI tract. It has both motor function and sensory function. We have accessory nerves that goes to your sternocleidomastoid. That is the 11. And hypoglossal nerve is number 12. So you have to know all these 12 nerves and its function. So here's the mnemonic. Oh, once you take the, an the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly, of course. So O for olfaction optic, oculomotor, and so forth. So it's been a long chapter, but we've covered a lot of things here. So we, what you have to know and remember always would be um, the brain is the seat of homeostasis. Your higher order thinking, your learning, your personality, your emotions, your memories, they're all in your brain. The three main divisions of the brain, the cerebel cerebrum, cerebellum, mesencephalon, diencephalons, and the brainstem, pons, medulla, oblongata, know their structure and function. And we went over it right now. Also remember that this, the brain is protected by the skull, the meninges, the CSF, and the blood-brain barrier. 
the meninges will dip into the brain, making the dural folds. So we have the cerebrum, um, the three dural folds, and then it also is a, it will have sinuses and conduit for arteries and veins. We studied the structures that uh, surround the thalamus. It's called the limbic system. This is your, how sensitive you are, your mood, your fight or flight response and all that. We studied the four ventricles of the brain, the lateral, third and the fourth ventricle, and they are lined with ependymal cells. They make the cerebrospinal fluid. So they will make about a half a liter of CSF every day. And then it, through the lateral aqueducts, it will go around the brain. And as it flows over the arachnoid uh, villi, it's going to get cleaned, which is very good. It's like a vacuum cleaner. It's going to clean the CSF. And then we'll go down the central canal of the spinal cord. It'll come up. It'll go around the brain again constantly, making sure your brain is sparkling clean. Our, blood, our brain is a very needy organ. It needs a lot of ATP. It needs a lot of oxygen to do its function and thinking. So it is, has the carotid arteries that will supply the brain and then it leaves as the juggler vein. And then we studied the main function of the 12 nerves of the brain. And I hope that was helpful.